Men think that politics is not the field of women. They think that this field is theirs. It's like they own it. I was persecuted in my country. I was sidelined. It was hard. There was actually a special program on radio castigating me every single day. I think I am a fighter. Not a crazy woman, but a dreamer. The African continent. One landmass, 55 sovereign countries, 55 heads of state, only two of whom are women. In 2005, Liberians went to the polls and elected Ellen Johnson Sirleaf as president, making her the first ever female head of state on the continent. How did she do it? What got in her way? What advice does she have for aspiring women leaders in Africa? All the women of Africa, bravo. I think we've come a long way. Not only in the presidency, where there are two of us now, I hope that within the next five years we'll see another two. And that uh, to strive that, I think we must all set those goals and we'll identify where the leadership qualities are, and then we should all network. Experience shows that leadership is not something you have to be born with. It's a skill that can be learned by women if they know where to look. Start early to have a very clear plan and course to be followed. Get the message out quick, reach out to people so that they know what your ideas are, how you intend to change their lives. And I think in those cases today you see a lot of responsiveness to, to women who are prepared to take the risk to run for office and prepare to stand up and say what they believe in and, and to ask for their support to enable them to achieve their goal. For this woman president, the signs of leadership were there from early childhood. A strong-willed character and a determination to work hard. When she was born, uh, this little old man came into the room and predicted it. But we always thought it was a joke. And so we'd laugh about it. And whenever she did anything foolish, we would laugh and say, there you go, Miss Greatness. But uh, it was interesting in that she, she was quite a young lady. Tomboyish, she used to climb trees and whatnot, but very studious. And so with our mother in the background, she had to be okay. Her grandmother was a former market woman, and she has a passion for the market women. She empowered the women, she encouraged us. She has given us the, the, the courage that we should also go to school and learn, that we can be a future leader for tomorrow also. So she empowered us a lot, and we learn a lot from her, and she's still teaching us. When I ran for president in 1997, I was just uh, leaving UNDP as head of the Africa Bureau. And so I used all my pension for that, and I exhausted that uh, to be able to support that campaign. But it was still very difficult for me, and so I was not seen as one that was well equipped uh, to run, so I could not get all over the country because of the lack of resources. And so I had a, and so I lost. In, in 2005, uh, when I did win, uh, by this time I think, uh, the local forces of those who wanted to see change in the country, particularly women, uh, put their own resources together, as meager as they were. Um, but it all came together in a much and professional women, market women, um, student organizations. They all, they all uh, supported 
our effort and we were able to win. So resources is an important part of um, enabling women toward a leadership position. In many parts of Africa, girls miss out on opportunities in favor of boys from an early age. When the family money is short, boys tend to be chosen for higher education, while their sisters are expected to look after the home. That is the culture that is now being challenged. In school, leadership isn't studied formally. It's only in adulthood that girls get a chance to understand what's needed if they are to rise to high public office. In 2012, Joyce Banda became just the second woman president in Africa. These are precious moments for me when I can see so many of you together, especially those that have similar causes and agendas just like mine. For her, the qualities of leadership are very clear. To be a leader, you must be prepared to serve. You must be the servant, a servant of the people, but you must also fall in love with the people that you serve and they must also fall in love with you. Once there's that bond, there's nobody, nobody can break away your, your love unless you two are prepared to part ways. That's how I look at my own relationship with the people that I serve. So I've spent my adult life serving people at grassroots, serving people in the church, serving people in, the, in my country. To me, it doesn't make any difference. Women are always loving people. So we believe that because of that kind of love that is in the family, she also do the same in, as a government. So that's why we still give her support. We like her. In all the years that I have known her, her style has been a, of caring, of reaching out to the grassroots, of mobilizing and just touching the lives and transforming the lives of ordinary people. And I believe that that is what she's doing even now. And it is going to be different from any, anybody else, first of all, because she's a woman. It's a good question from our... True leadership is about building capacity, not personal aggrandizement. For me, my mission in life is to assist women and youth gain social and political empowerment through business and education. I drew this mission statement when I was... 29, I think. So all I've done throughout my life is to empower women economically and to send as many youths as possible to school. And um, it is extremely important because uh, I was just in a meeting now. The lady had to remind me, she's very rich now, very prominent businesswoman in South Africa. But she says, well, I went to Joyce Banda Foundation School. I was in Form 1. I remember you coming and addressing us. I don't even remember their faces. The, my greatest satisfaction is when I see young women that will come, walk over to me and say, I am this because you were there. Africa is making considerable progress in regard to women in leadership positions. Much progress has been made in many countries. It is my belief that this is the beginning of the rise of African women taking up positions of leadership. Inspiring others is a sentiment that's shared by Rebecca Kadaga, the first woman speaker in Uganda's parliament. Here in this parliament, there are people who tell me that uh, when I went to visit to speak to them at the university, they decided they wanted to be like me, and now they're here in parliament with me. So, they, so I go to the schools, I go to the universities, and uh, I work with the young people. Most successful leaders have themselves been inspired by someone else. Often it's a mother or a father or a prominent leader from history. What made them stand out? What can you learn from them? I was inspired by people like Indira Gandhi, who was a, a Prime Minister of India, Golda Meir, who was also a Prime Minister for Israel. And uh, th those were some of our role models, but locally we didn't have that many. There are a lot of people who inspired me, for example, Rosa Parks and the leader Gandhi. They are idols for me because they fight human issues. There are three women that influenced me. My, my great-grandmother, 
was a very wise woman and would always sit down and tell me the values of being an African woman. My grandmother was the, the, the opposite of my great-grandmother. My grandmother was a fighter. My grandmother was an entrepreneur. My grandmother told me from age five, six, seven, to fight for my rights. My mother was the opposite. My mother was like my great-grandmother. But she also stood by her husband. Malimu, Julius Nereri, I think, is one. And I did have the opportunity now and then to be in meetings with him and to, and to talk to him. And I, I liked his humility and the man in which he, and of course, uh, our own African icon, Nelson Mandela. Uh, we all see him as a, as a great figure that we all aspire to, to have the same kinds of um, characters and values that he exhibited. Almost always, leaders are defined when they face adversity. That is what determines your character. We operate on a very hostile platform. Up until now, men feel it is their domain. So you're breaking into an area where you shouldn't go. And so they will do everything and anything possible to make sure that you get discouraged. A lot of women do not have the resources to run a campaign. Uh, then in some cases there is violence. Some people don't want to get involved with violence. You can get badly insulted if you don't have a thick skin. You'll probably chicken out and uh, say, I don't want to do this work. Working for a new idea, a woman uh, candidate under uh, a military regime, that's not easy. They banned uh, me to talk in the TV and in the media. We are uh, living in a patriarchal society where men think that they, they should be in every job and the women, they treat women like imposters and sometimes want to make it difficult for you to, to do your work. So you really have to be extra good. People uh, don't really trust maybe young people. They don't want that be represented but young people, especially a female one. The police um, alert all people surrounded me and I found myself like in a desert. Always they told me, don't criticize the, the army and you can <laughs> collect a uh, signature. How can we collect signature uh, in, in silence? I don't know. Most of the challenge I faced was when I got into parliament for the very, very first time. Obviously, I was a woman and I was young. So those that were the challenges that uh, I, I felt as I was coming in and I had to rise above them. I just didn't want to make them bring me down or feel any less of a priority than any of the other members of parliament. So, yeah, that's how I got it. And then from then, I proved myself. And before, before I realized it, after two years, I was just appointed into cabinet. Leadership is about building bridges. And successful women leaders know that they can't succeed alone. If women are to succeed, they have to win men over, not treat them as the enemy. Women are wives and mothers, so most times their primary uh, priority is the home. They have to take care of children, sometimes young children, and pay attention to them. That prevents them from being able to travel as much, prevents them from being able to participate in so many meetings outside in the society. Men also, you know, are more um, enlightened. Men now share some of the burdens of the home. So women are in a much better position now to be able to compete and to achieve their leadership goals. My husband was the chief justice in this country, and chief justice of Swaziland. Because he has achieved so much in his life, there has never been a time when he has felt threatened by my success. And for your information, it is him who first saw it in me. Throughout my career, he has stood by me. He has been my best friend. And I think that is important. But, but again, I've been lucky that I've, been, I've had a wider supportive family. So what would Africa look like if there were more women leaders? Today's leaders are clear that it would be a better place for women and men alike. I think the world would be better 
better managed and better organized if there were more women's voices than they are today. Africa would stand to benefit if half of its human resource was fully utilized and given an opportunity and a voice. And uh, what gives me hope is the fact that um, men have opened up. And I'm very sincere when I say that. But I didn't think I would see that in my lifetime. We would have a politically stable Africa, you know, essentially free of conflict. And with that, we'll be able to, to achieve our development goals at a much faster pace. For these women to have attained high public office is a proud achievement. With Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma, the African Union itself now has its first female head. But our journey has just begun. For the first time in decades, there are signs of real economic improvement all over Africa. With each passing year, more women are participating in this change. But women are still grossly underrepresented in Africa's corridors of power. Women's leadership is not a novelty, but a challenge for the next generation to stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before them. Don't think about winning. Don't think about parliament. Don't think about presidency. Think that you are participating. This is the main thing. If you are participating, that means that you are not paving the way to men to take your place.